Welcome, folks, for episode five of Movement Medicine. And today we have Dr. Divya Parashar and uh, Dr. Darren Clear, my co-host. So Divya, just jump into it and you know, just give a little introduction to your uh, you know, formal training and academic training. So please tell us about yourself, please. I'm Dr. Divya Parashar. I'm a clinical and rehab psychologist, and I have my own practice. Um, I did my PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2004. um and uh, um i've just been practicing i was at a hospital before that and then just started in practice last year excellent and what about uh, getting into you know this whole fitness journey your active journey that is there so why did you pick it up and where you so in 2003 i was diagnosed with metabolic syndrome and i was obese at that time uh, pretty overweight um but whatever i did nothing was working so i knew i had to kind of do something about uh, getting back to being fit again not just on the scale but you know overall health wise um so i lost weight under the guidance of a nutritionist i started exercising then um and once i was uh, once i was fit enough i st- i took to running in 2009 because i said i wanted to sustain that momentum i started enjoying being physically active so running came along in 2009 and i've been uh, running half marathons and a few full marathons since then so this is my uh, 11th year of uh, being a runner what sort of challenges did you face on that journey as a runner yeah and just getting into fitness and physical activity so i was physically active but because of the the pre diabetes that i was in i was in insulin resistance whatever i was doing wasn't really clearly um helping me get fit till the time i actually started fixing my uh, diet as well so of course that goes hand in hand uh, the challenge was just getting moving with all that weight i was 100 plus kilos it was just uh, just that inertia to get going i had plantar fasciitis at that time so there would be aches and pains and i would just be like okay you know um and then of course you want to start uh, big right i have to do this i have to exercise an hour a day you set all these lofty goals and you realize you know it's sometimes good to start small and start slow so it's just it was pretty much a mind game at that point just trying to get into a groove of sustaining a momentum of exercising um of actually setting realistic goals and saying you know what it's for the long haul so once my weight was in the ideal category it was then about sustaining it i said i need a new challenge to uh, pursue and so you know running just happened uh, by accident but uh, i got hooked on to it and and still am uh, i love it so yeah excellent and what i was asking was about your strength training uh, you mm-hmm. know how big a role has that played so besides being a runner or what else so that of course uh, uh, and i know you keep saying that right uh, if running is your love strength training is your mother in law isn't there something like that you say that <laughs> so yeah so uh, honestly i i think i've never i've never i haven't enjoyed strength training much but i realized uh, recently um, in conversations uh, with you as well that uh, without it you can't really be an efficient runner so it's only in the last year when i've started uh, fixing some of the issues that i've had with muscle imbalances and uh, literally focusing on strength training you see the effect it has on running performance so i would say not been not been a big fan but currently yes pursuing it very actively about at least two to three times a week is uh, where i dedicate to strength training do you find a difference with that oh uh, totally i uh, i my i'm not the injuries aren't as frequent so earlier i would have a lot of pain in my hip or uh, my back uh, i of course uh, got diagnosed with a bunch of things like trochanteric bursitis and it band syndrome and things like that the fancy terms that uh, that were thrown at me but i realized that the more i started focusing on strength training uh, those injuries uh, were not as frequent i run better honestly in these 10 years uh, i never had thought i never pushed pace to be honest but uh, just as a result of the strength training i'm automatically seeing an increase in my running performance i'm running better i'm breathing better so i think you realize that you tend to take um, breathing for granted with our sedentary lifestyle so the exercises that have been taught have actually helped uh, with breathing better simple things like the spirometer that of course has helped as well 
um so definitely in terms of recovery post run recovery as well the soreness isn't there uh, as much as it used to be earlier but just in better efficient use of uh, of uh, the muscular muscle systems i guess no it's excellent what are the most common mm-hmm. exercises that you're doing then with strength training so currently i'm focusing of course on mobilizing better so uh, like completely like from arms literally to ankles and feet and calves and hair hips so it's like i follow a, a 10 minute uh, mobilizing program which has been really good at least it gets the stiffness out of the way but simple things like planks push ups uh, heel raises single heel raises um lunges um i've started doing weighted squats i used to hate squats and lunges but i realized that you can't really do without them uh, reverse lunges so like i said i'm just a beginner in that but just at least um i think one of the things you realize that you honestly need your muscles to be activated well enough to run better and that's where i was lacking all these years so i would say i was a recreational uh, jogger uh, for 10 years but i think now i'm beginning to get a sense of what running actually uh, involves um but just uh, body weights more i don't i'm not a big fan of using uh, very heavy weights but just body weights like mountain climbers and inchworm exercises burpees all of those i think um, are totally helping in that sense that's great mm-hmm. so with the your running and you know because that's what you've been doing primarily for last 11 years how do you find that connect with you know the conditions that you end up seeing being a psychologist uh do you see benefits with that oh totally a lot of people continue asking me that uh, you know how do i maintain my sense of calm and positivity towards the end of a long work day as well and a lot of people have seen me in back to back sessions even at work and i think uh, i will always say it's because running has a huge role to play for me it's a stress buster for sure i think a lot of my um uh uh my stress gets relieved from there from pounding the roads uh, three four times a week and of course i feel like i'll get a lot of uh, creativity in terms of even trying to conceptualize cases and interventions so i think about work a little bit while i run because a lot of clarity comes uh, when i uh, run as well and plus what it does to my mood like i said it's a stress buster so i automatically at the end of a long day or you know when i know i'm stressed um i have to go for that run and i know it just feels so much better after that there's a really mm-hmm. interesting point that you raised there about being able to conceptualize certain things whilst you're running mm-hmm. right. you know i've had a lot of people say that they can organize their thoughts they can plan you know a lot better when they run so sort of why do you mm-hmm. think that is is that because you know running has sort of that regular tempo so it helps you kind of organize certain things or what kind of elements of running mm-hmm. do you think really help with that so i um i honestly in my work talk a lot about mindfulness uh, which is basically just paying attention to thoughts and feelings in the present moment so people who meditate uh, are tend to be pursuing mindfulness but now in this uh, day and age when a lot of people find it very difficult to sit still and meditate i often say is there any activity you can do where you feel like you can be in that state of flow and concentration so whether it's you know cooking or whether it's any zumba pilates running whatever it is so what i what it does is of course i think the way uh, the synchronized breathing works the way the rhythmic action works when you're running it just gets you into that state of flow and uh, and that state of relaxation as well and so of course i think the fact that you're breathing and you're breathing uh, diaphragmatic breathing also happens there so you just in general calmer i think it has a lot of cognitive effects where the focus starts coming in um you're able to just uh, with that synchronized activity focus a lot better so i think that's where a lot of people say that they're calmer they then when you're calmer and you're in a good space that's when you open up that space for being positive and creative you organize your thoughts better so i think at the end of the run it's like you've got your work day sorted out and you know just how to attack that um and then of course the endorphins i mean i know we'll talk about how the you know the mood lifts and so when you're in a better space emotionally is when you're actually more productive and efficient and i think running or any synchronized activity walking swimming whatever it is that's what it does to people but then it's also the beliefs we add to it like how many people we've met who said oh for 
for my life i could never run or i, I just find it very frustrating but i think it's also the mindset we it's like a reinforced thing right when you're um, when you run you feel better so it reinforces that cycle so i think it's also the belief of what an activity does to you that keeps you going and um, that channelizes your energy and how has it changed your practice i mean you been at it for 11 years you know fair yeah. enough but do you see that over time versus what you were trained as mm-hmm. have you kind of customized a little bit more for this whole physical activity has that kind of gone into your practice Oh absolutely so any uh, client who comes to me and a lot of them are focused on having sadness depression anxiety stress come what may um my one prescription to them always is some form of physical activity and again whatever they want to start with i'll never set lofty goals saying oh 30 minutes every day i'll be like okay even if it you can start with 10 minutes a day because let's say let's take an example of somebody who's depressed who's anyways having trouble getting out of bed they don't have a routine they don't have a structure they have a lot of inertia so initially i work with kind of what we call behavior activation which is like you know what let's just get out of bed and start doing things so whether it's you know and that of course has to be mutually agreed upon so it's like okay can you do any physical activity which you enjoy it could be dancing to your to a video on uh, youtube but whatever it is so it just helps them get start i mean get start a, a a structure to their day and then that starts them feeling a little better and then they can at least start putting the pieces of the puzzle together let alone like i said we've all heard about it right exercises and endorphin kick uh, it beats stress if everybody believed it we wouldn't be having any un- unhealthy stressed out individuals but i think uh, for a lot of them they start noticing that a walk let's say even if they're in pain and i deal with a lot of chronic pain and physical activity as well that that itself starts helping them feel better which helps with their pain getting better so or their anxiety is better their restlessness is more channelized into a physical activity so it's just channelizing it's just getting them kick started it's having them see that lift in the mood which then like i said acts as a reinforcement where they start doing this more more than more so for me yes every person who comes by i will say physical activity but let's talk about what physical activity would you want to do because it can't just be hey you've got to run it has to be customized to their likes and their preferences yeah no that's fantastic um in the in the scientific and medical literature at the moment there's a phrase which is coming out a lot about neuroplasticity and exercise mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and being able to sort of reinforce memories i just wonder whether you could explain a little bit about that for us um of course i mean uh, it it's all, it's almost like um we do talk about uh, you know in a ways in which we can rewire the brain right and i keep saying that a lot of times in these days and age we we are so wired to pick up distressing signals uh, from the environment so similarly it's rewiring the brain to form those pathways in which we can focus on being optimistic or resilient or being rather than feeling helpless and hopeless can we feel more in charge or can we feel like we're able to manage things so the neuroplasticity that we talked about a lot of people think that oh, if this is how it is this is how we are wired to be and we can't change but honestly with uh, with the reinforced activity they form all these pathways and newer connections in which people are noticing cognitive changes or changes in their mood um, which then translate into behavior so yes of course we are seeing i mean simply if you look at even the database on meditation and what it does to people with mental health uh, issues the fact that we are just changing the way the brain is wired and is responding to stress and what a simple act of diaphragmatic breathing or mindfulness based meditation does to the to the cerebrum or to the to the brain i think that itself is is evidence enough that these things work and physical activity has known to play a big role in that as well <clears throat> and what about misconceptions there are like you know majority of people that would come or often you would see that people are not aware of simple things or they know it the wrong way mm-hmm. uh, because of course so called common sense what are those mm-hmm. common three four things that you would think about misconceptions or myths um i'll actually talk about one of the most common ones which i know is uh, is overlaps with my field which is um the fact that if ever somebody is on 
psychotropic or psychiatric drugs it means they will be forever hooked on to it and dependent on it i know that i mean and i know i'm talking about medicine here but a lot of times there are people who may need to be on medication because of the severity and intensity of their mental health illness mental illness but that's the that's one of the myths where i bust where saying okay it doesn't lead to dependency if you're under the proper care of a mental health team so that for me takes a big time big uh, chunk of my time trying to explain the other one which i commonly face is if i talk about my sadness uh, i'm i'm actually reinforcing it and it's going to be here to stay so a lot of times people actually are fearful of confronting their emotions because they think it's just stagnant and it's not going to get better and there's no point talking about it and that's the other thing where i kind of educate people or speak to them about saying every emotion has a role to play and if we are feeling fearful or anxious or sad our mind is telling us something which we need to work on and and emotions have to be given space and have to be mobilized so again in terms of the third one which i commonly face is if they are coming to see me it means i'm going to fix their problems i will talk to them for an hour and they are magically going to get better and i tell them when they are working with me and again with any therapist 10% of what they do in session is what we facilitate but 90% of it are reflections and things that they need to focus on when they go out which is what we teach them or try and educate them about because a lot of times they just outsource it saying oh we are here for you we are here to see you you need to tell us what to do and i'm like no that's not how it works you have to work on that transformation and changing the way you're looking at things or bringing about that change so it is mainly about um, you know just the process of psychotherapy and counseling and uh, and then you know the stigma around it uh, as well which is something again that uh, um if i have a mental illness i have a character weakness or i'm i'm an inherently weak person so they do not seek help because of that and uh, that's again a common myth um, anger is inherited that's again a common myth so so just a lot of those that i tend to educate people about um and if i look at it pain is strictly physical and i know that you and i have worked uh, across uh, disciplines with pain uh, with you seeing it in clinic and uh, me seeing it uh, seeing it as well that if you've come to see uh, a physician for pain then why am i seeing a psychologist so then again a lot of counseling and a lot of psychoeducation goes in that as well oh that's great So what would be your sort of basic recommendation mm-hmm. then for someone who's not currently physically active and who might be suffering mm-hmm. from a little oh. bit of depression or anxiety what would be a kind of a basic recommendation for those people mm-hmm. to get started Mhm So one of the things I I always um, ask is okay what vision do you see for yourself when you start feeling better um and so then at least they have something to look forward to or to work with um i educate them about why uh um uh, a physical activity is important and i'll honestly for the first week just try it on an experimental basis saying you know what just get out of bed just get out for 10 minutes and see how you feel so it's not like a like a prescription it's more like just see how you feel with that just get up just engage in this one activity they do end up coming back and saying that really that felt really good so then we work on setting goals saying okay how can we fit this or how can this be a priority for you for the next number of you know days how many days in the week can you work out what would you like to work out with you know so kind of setting their goals um and just starting like i said you don't have to do 30 minutes an hour just whenever you can so a lot of people morning evening i'm like whenever you can can you be even physically active through the day if you have a sedentary job can you just get up every 30 minutes walk around a bit when or stretch a little bit so i think they start noticing uh small changes just with that and then like i said it kind of reinforces because they're able to sleep better now uh, exercise also is known to help people sleep better and not just with mood so they start noticing the benefits and that just fits into their lifestyle better so my guideline is always let's figure out what you like doing how much can you put into it and which we gradually increase over the period of weeks that we are working and how motivated are they because it shouldn't just be me telling them so the reason they experiment come back feeling good you know uh, maybe it works but if nothing if they say no i didn't feel good with this okay what else can you 
you know so i'm gently the one who kind of just a uh, nudge um uh, we just kind of nudge uh, people to just say you know uh, what else is there anything else that you can think of so they know i'm relentless when i'm uh, uh, when i'm telling them why physical activity is needed brilliant thank right, you so there was a question yeah there was a question from one of the you know audience ways in which anxiety manifests and what can be done about it so what do you have to say about that mm -hmm. so again i think a lot of times uh, anxiety depression they're all used very interchangeably and a lot of times they also coexist so if i had to honestly talk about it it could be you know just feeling in general nervous restless fidgety irritable i would say even sadness withdrawal from activities um a lot of times people feel more panic struck or helpless or hopeless so there and then of course we're looking at if you look at it these are just emotional mental symptoms we may see loss of concentration the biggest one being i'm unable to focus on anything or i'm losing my memory and so then i'll step back and say the reason you're forgetful is because attention and concentration may be compromised because a lot of times we'll just have these racing buzzing thoughts that go behind as a stream in our head and we are unable to focus on what we are doing so then having them be mindfully aware it manifests physically as well like we've spoken about you know pain chronic pain um, gut issues a lot of times people will uh, complain of irritable bowel or on the other spectrum constipation dizziness headaches so the the symptoms could be so many rajat honestly because it's just something which is so commonly experienced with people but then there are specific disorders right we'll have a panic disorder or an ocd those are all subsets of anxiety so it's a lot that would just require a whole separate podcast on uh, on uh, symptoms of anxiety and how it and what and what can be done with it honestly i will speak about mindfulness again but again it 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 has to be customized to each person but i will generally for every person emphasize a lot of mindfulness based activities which basically has them tune into how they're thinking and feeling and being in the present moment because that's the thing with anxiety it anticipates the worst case scenarios in the future and the idea of the mind is let's just stay in the present moment and uh, focus on bringing about a balance in thoughts as well the thoughts are more catastrophizing like what's the worst that's going to happen um you know we start predicting doomsdays and all of that in our head mentally and so how does one rein those in using you know uh, therapy interventions and uh, self management exercises like meditation and physical activity less caffeine no alcohol sleeping better uh improving sleep hygiene becomes important that i think it was just sort of some final thoughts really i think obviously you've sort of covered a lot there about sort of mental health issues um sort of the cognitive benefits of exercise um mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, was there anything else that you wanted to sort of raise that we might have missed sort of any I think, other conditions uh, yeah. that you might not have considered i mean i uh one of the things that i like i said uh, that i emphasize with people is these days an overall sense of well being so it's not just physical it's not just mental it could be spiritual it could be social vocational so just that whole spectrum of well being is uh, and how we look at that is one of the ways in which i honestly conceptualize uh, plans that i work with um and again um how whoever comes in i think the bigger point uh, uh, is how do we create purpose and meaning in lives more than just focusing on mood wise being uplifted or being happy so it's more about okay what can we do beyond that how can we create our own purpose and meaning in life so that at least has more sustaining um, visions and goals for people to work with rather than just feeling mood wise lifted because of the ways stressors work these days that just goes up and down but having a sustained focus and purpose in life is what uh, generally is something that i tend to work with uh, a lot with people on these days so great mm -hmm. brilliant and uh, you know i'll just touch on our partners because that will be relevant uh, for you to maybe a couple of questions on that so fit india has come on board and you know they are partnering with this whole initiative of ours so that's wonderful thank you fit india uh, the other one obviously back to fitness the clinic that you work at uh, but lalra what about people who do such things you know who are pushing the limits 
who are doing things which others have said can't be done. You know, could be a distance as short as 55. I call it short, but that's the shortest mm. distance we have. Mm. And then triple one, triple two, triple three, triple five. Why do people do such things? So uh, that's what I did in 2019, right? I wanted to know the answers to those questions too. Like, why do people run these crazy distances? And I know you. I like how you're calling 55 short, which is that's the first ultra marathon I'm targeting this year, if it ever happens with the way things are. But um, it's it's been an incredible learning just observing and interviewing these people. And one of the things that they've all, in a way, emphasized is. what more do i have like what's the potential that i can tap into with each crazy distance i run whether it's triple 2 and a lot of them are incrementally running though somebody ran triple 2 3 triple 5 in previous years what's the potential that i have that i can tap into they all came back with learnings uh, which basically spoke about the mental aspects that it's the persistence the bouncing back from adversity i mean you're running days on end uh, you're on your feet days on end you're hallucinating you're having psychotic symptoms but you're still observing them and and moving forward in a structured organized way um i think it just changes people as as individuals like one said that you know you forget the physical aspects and you realize that it's the mind that just takes you forward um so that self transcendence but they forgot what pain meant i mean imagine triple 5 or triple 3 whatever be the distance they forgot the alt- altitude the rarity in the oxygen it was just persisting so it was also for those who were uh, who were more introverts and who uh, you know relied on themselves they realized the sub- importance of social support so the crew that uh, that la ultra has a lot of them said you know it's a team sport and they were able to appreciate that connectivity with so much more gratitude at that point like learning to be good team players like managing their own emotions by learning to work with teams despite being and you know despite taking on such a difficult challenge in that way so you know and meditation most of them spoke about the power of just meditation and breathing how that helped them visualization chunking their uh, runs into smaller segments so they all spoke about the cognitive and the emotional um, aspects of uh, running in that sense as well so yeah that was that was uh, a fabulous experience there if i may i mean the other you know the project that we are uh, working on is called moving mountains within and it's about the 10th edition the last year's la ultra uh, the high that happened and just a little bit more about that the way if you could like what is it about what are we trying to do with it moving mountains within um so again that's uh, based on uh, just the runners uh, across all categories and uh, what that basically means is yeah they were running in the himalayas which itself is one of the most difficult places to run in at that altitude with that oxygen but it's literally what did they do within to persist and persevere the challenges they overcame their journeys their stories you know uh, if i can share that that you know we were all wondering and because you had introduced triple 5 for the first time you know will anybody finish and of course uh, everybody was like uh, we don't know or no but to just have three out of five people finish and even the others who didn't how they persisted um and their the challenges that they overcame um just just their journey uh, of pain of overcoming pain of of how even failure was a very humbling experience so for those also who couldn't complete it was just a very humbling experience and how they said you know what we're going to come back next year and take this on so failure was such and i think we often look down on failure right but for most of them and for all of them honestly i'm yet to meet someone who has bummed out about it it was just that failure was such a beautiful learner as well so it's just the the emotional the mental psychological aspects of those runners and what it honestly taught all of us uh uh who are observing it to look at adversity in that way that okay can we have that mindset to to or what it takes to actually overcome challenges so so i learned a lot inspired me to to think about 50k brilliant brilliant fantastic uh, i think we'll just call it a wrap here because i think is the best way to you know with mountains uh, moving mountains with them the idea was it's not so much physical it's about inside getting up in the morning is moving a mountain within wearing those shoes is moving a mountain within 
so that was the idea behind this whole project and so that will be out uh, depending on what happens with the storm virus so please contribute help us uh, whichever way you can because these stories are amazing for humanity more than anything else it's not about an individual right so we just call it wrap here and thank you divya it was wonderful having you thank you and yeah thank you guys yeah. thank you darren and thanks rajat this is fun pleasure, pleasure. thanks <laughs>